Hey, this is Ashley Wilson, founder and CEO at AuditMate. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change and navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, Dennis Giannoutsis. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey, welcome to the show, Leadership is Changing. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Leaders everywhere confront similar obstacles because people are people, but everywhere you go, leaders are overwhelmed, disrupted, and under pressure. They run from email to email, meeting to meeting. Many leaders are not changing quick enough, which means they run the risk of becoming irrelevant and being left behind. So perhaps the show is taking our listeners' leadership to another level by finding their balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. I believe we don't have enough effective leaders in the world today, and if we can get the leaders to step up and lead change, then they can inspire real change. Hey, listeners, it's now time to adapt in our fast-moving world. Hey, listeners, welcome to the episode today of Leadership is Changing. We're glad to have you here with us again. I've got a wonderful guest with me today. Her name is Ashley Wilson. She is a San Francisco-based entrepreneur raised by a used car salesman and an elevator guy. Tapping into her roots, Ashley's opened and sold multiple small businesses by the age of 20 until ultimately landing in the elevator business. Ashley is the CEO who gets results without sacrificing human dignity. In this new vanguard of leadership, if you're not values-based and human-centric in your approach, no one succeeds. Ashley, a big welcome to you. Thank you for having me, Dennis. Yeah, very good. Whereabouts are you in the world today? I am in San Francisco, sunny San Francisco today. Very nice. Is that in the Bay Area or somewhere else? Whereabouts in San Francisco? In the Bay Area, yeah. I'm right in the city. I'm actually in the Mission District in San Francisco. Very nice. I used to visit Palo Alto a lot mm-hmm. um, in my old life, if I can put it that way. I used to work for Hewlett Packard. Used to go there a lot, and um, yeah, um, very nice place. I love it. It's really cool. Uh, Ashley, I've just given a quick introduction to our listeners about you. Tell us a little bit more about your background. But before you go there, um, when you say you, ha- when I said it was about being a CEO, what do we mean by that? What's the name of the company? I think it's Automate. Tell us a little bit about that, but a little bit more about your background too. Yeah. So um, a little about my background. I've always been this just super loud and curious kid who was never afraid to question anyone in authority if I thought that it was unethical or just didn't make sense. And, you know, that those big differences about me um, really, you know, in my childhood made it fun and exciting. And my teenage years were probably the um, terrifying and terrible. And then, but it's ultimately the reason that I was brave enough to start AuditMate, right? Like I believe that leaders should be human centric and that we actually work for our people versus the other way around. I think that companies should be here to make the world a little bit better. And, um, that's really where AuditMate was founded from. So I joined the elevator industry in my early twenties and quickly found that, these insane profits were a direct result of people not understanding contracts and elevator companies not doing their job. And mm. so AuditMate was born out of this passion of believing that building owners didn't need to be elevator experts. They just need honest and transparent information to be able to make good decisions and then go back to their real jobs, right? Their jobs are not just managing elevator vendors. They're, they're, they're managing buildings. So we're here to get clients a hundred percent of what they're paying for. And, and meanwhile, just disrupting what, what business looks like and, and what employees look like. And, um, it's kind of being loud and obnoxious all the time. Yeah. Very cool. And I, I actually think that's a really quite a, that's a very strong skill to have is the ability to ask questions and question things. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel that leaders today in the industry and business owners and so forth question enough? No. No. Not most of them. <laughs> I don't think we're curious enough. I think we need to be more curious about 
the the people that make up our organizations, including customers, including employees, including partners, right? Like all humans that interact with our organization all feel like they're contributing in different ways and see value in different ways and being able to really tap into that. There's a culture there that you might not be aware of or a part of at all as a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's very good. And I love the word curious. I think it's a very good word in the sense that should be used a lot by a lot of leaders. And, um, you know, people aren't just a number. They, no. they are real people and we need to treat them really well. And as you, as I said in the introduction too, about, you know, treating people with dignity, mm-hmm. I think is important. Now, my question to you here is how did you get into leadership? I think as a kid, it was just this natural state of being, right? If there was a project, I was leading it. Um, and it just organically felt good for me to be in the place of bringing people together, of structuring projects and deliverables in a way that made it easier on others. Like, hey, this is what you're good at. Let me set out the stage so that I can um, eliminate roadblocks for you so that you can do what you want to do and they can do what they want to do. And then we can feel like we're contributing. Um But in a manager sense, um, that really developed in in the elevator industry um, was what my first roles in like actual people leading as a job title. Yep, yep, yep. What was that like for you? Because I mean, in the industry of elevators, uh, I don't know about the US, but I do know, say, in in New Zealand, there are not many females that are involved in the elevator industry. What was that like for you? I mean, is that true for you in the US? And what was it like? Yeah, I think it's true globally, for sure, in the elevator industry. It's very male dominated. Absolutely. Um, When I first stepped into my first my first managerial role, I am a very analytical person. I want everything in a spreadsheet. um, And I want to know all the tasks that are a part of the big picture. And for me to wrap my head around that not everybody wants their whole life in a spreadsheet, I think was my first big learning curve of a leader of like, oh, people felt like I was micromanaging them, but that's just how I managed my life. Right. Right. And so that was a, that was a really big learning curve for me. Um, but as far as being a woman and being a queer woman, right? And and I'm a small woman and I'm a young woman and I'm really loud. And and I'm not going to sit around if something doesn't feel good and say, oh yeah, just keep going, right? And so I was constantly disruptive. I, I was the problem, right? It, it became that the industry wasn't the problem or the lack of accountability wasn't the problem. It became that I was the problem because I was so different in so many ways. Um, which is ultimately why I left. Okay. And then you, so later on you've started Automate. So you've gone in there now and you're disrupting the market even so, even more so in the sense of saying to, to customers, hey, are you really paying too much for what you're getting? Hey, elevator kind of businesses, are you actually delivering what you're doing and um, what you promised to de- deliver? And I think that you've gone in again and disrupted it again. So I think what you've actually just said to me before, I'm constantly disrupting things. Yep. Absolutely. And just my presence alone disrupts things, right? I I made myself fit into a box for a really long time in the clothes that I wore and, you know, even my glasses, right? Like I, I wear loud glasses. I wear loud jewelry. I have tattoos, right? And when I left the elevator industry, I'm like, God, that doesn't feel good. That can't feel good for other people too. I like feeling seen. I think other people like feeling seen as well. And in fact, I work better and am more productive and more efficient when I don't have to worry about how I'm dressed or if I'm uncomfortable in the clothes that I'm wearing or if I'm uncomfortable or feel like I need to wear this mask in order to be taken seriously. And so that was a big change for me of like, professional doesn't have to look a certain way. Um, the color of my hair does not change my intellect (laughs) right and so that's something that i i'm really pushing against is is we can look however we want we can dress however we want we can be whatever 
whatever gender and that that doesn't make you any more or less qualified mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah that's that's really cool stuff and i'm actually quite keen to learn a little bit more about what you said because i mean that that there must be listeners out there today who are thinking about i actually probably don't fill into a box is what they're thinking and they're thinking well then what does that mean for me am i wrong am i the am i the problem as you're saying before where Maybe it's others as well, and the way their perceptions too. I remember going to Europe, uh, probably 1996, and I came back at the end of 2000 back to New Zealand. And then all of a sudden, nobody was wearing ties, and it was like, "What the heck happened here?" And then, and then you see them wearing even more and more casual now. Now, and then going into Palo Alto, seeing the CEO of a large major corporation wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and you're like, "Whoa!" But you know what? They're still earning billions of dollars. Is, and they're still a huge, awesome leader. It's just they were dressing a little bit different. In fact, they were dressing to meet their customers' needs and, and be relatable to people and their employees, which I, I think is really quite interesting. And so have you seen a big shift in that kind of way of people dressing and the way they come across and in that, and particularly in the U.S., but probably around the world as well? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm here in the Bay Area, so I joke often. You don't know if someone is houseless or a millionaire in San Francisco. You don't, right? And and here we have such a culture of treating everyone the same anyway. It's just inherent in who we are. But I love that about San Francisco and about the businesses in San Francisco is you can't judge a book by its cover here. And isn't that a lesson in just humanity for us? And and yes, in business too, even, even I think our banking and our corporate world is, is even a little more relaxed than the rest of the country, right? You know, you can, you compare New York City to Honolulu, right? Big difference. It's a big difference. Like I worked in Hawaii and corporate guys would come out. And I'd be like, you got to take off the suit and the jacket. And they're like, what? And I'm like, if you take off, if you leave your suit and your, your tie on or your jacket suit and your tie on, it's going to change the energy of the meeting so much that this customer will not trust us. And they're like, what do you mean? And they're like, they're not going to speak freely in front of you. They're going to feel like you're an outsider or that they don't fit in. And it's going to shift the dynamics so much. Like you need to dress to your audience. You need to make people feel comfortable. And, and that level of dress is, is not culturally appropriate there. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? And um, I find a lot of people do do that. They fly into another country or another part of their own country and they don't adjust. And then they wonder why they get pushed back or it doesn't work for them. And, and they're not relatable. I remember going from the top of New Zealand where I am at the moment to the bottom of New Zealand where it's near towards the Antarctic. And um, what's really funny is that people there, they're just totally different, right? And they just think differently, but they, they're mm-hmm. just beautiful people. And they're really, really warm, friendly, wanting to welcome you. Um, but they're also wanting to do business too. And so I think it's just understanding that as well. Ashley. I've got a question here for you. Now, this person could be alive or from history. Who's your favorite leader and why? My stepdad, for sure. Um, Mm. And I think it's in the way that I've watched him evolve over the past 10 years. And being a white man in the elevator industry that's operated the same way for a very long time, um, and the leadership is, you know, a very dominant, very hierarchical And to watch him realize and see how much more his team trusted him when he spoke to them in different ways or when he expanded his worldview or when and and the shifts that he made over the last 10 years. And he's always had some of the most loyal people, but him growing as a human and watching how that changed his team was just some of the coolest thing I've ever witnessed. And that one of his um, employees was having a hard time being efficient and, and getting his job done. And so my stepdad said, okay, I'm going to do your job for a week. We're going to forward all your emails to me. And the only way for me to understand what the problem is, is for me to get all of your calls and all of your emails. I had never in my life heard of a leader saying, I'm going to truly put myself in your shoes for an entire week 
so we can figure out what's going on because mm. it would have been so easy to say, you're not good enough. You're not doing your job. But he knew that this person was truly tying and trying. And there was some disconnect there that he couldn't figure out from the outside. And so he did it right. He put his email on vacation and then transferred all of this guy's calls and emails to himself so that he could dig in and figure out what was going on. And, and it was things like that, that just, wow, we can change our approach to leadership in a way that when we work for our people versus our people working for us, the shift that happens in your organization and your culture is visceral. Mm-hmm. I've just got goosebumps by you just saying that. I think that's um, it's it's really magic to see it happening, right? And that it's a beautiful thing when it does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just about the fact that from a generational perspective, right? A lot of organizations today have different generations working together, and for sometimes that's that can be a little bit difficult. And just to hear from both side, from from what you know, you're given as an example from your stepdad, but also from your your own perspective too. That's really, really good to see and hear, uh, which is good. The title of the show is called Leadership is Changing. And when I say that title, that statement, what does that mean for you? My first thought is, thank goodness. (laughs) I'm here for it. I want to be a part of it. Um, It makes me so happy to, to see it and to see people change. And it makes me happy for the folks that were standing alone for so long that are finally getting validation in in the areas of like heart-centered leadership, right? That it's like, oh, emotions need to stay out of business. And then we're like, wait, actually, when we talk about emotions, we do better. (laughs) Teams do better. Our employees feel better. Wait, hold on. Um, So I just fully support it and embrace it. Yeah, it's good. And embracing is one of those things as well. I mean, Supporting is one thing, but actually embracing it and helping, going through it yourself, but then helping others as well is important. You and I are living in, and everyone in the world and our listeners right now are living in a world that's getting faster all the time. And it's been faster, it's getting faster, and we're seeing a very fast-paced, ever-changing world. Change fast in the sense of data, social technology, business. Um, what do you think makes a leader successful today in that fast-paced, ever-changing world? First thing we touched on earlier was being curious. I think that we we need to remain curious and open. Um, and then we need to do some introspection, mm-hmm. which I think is can be really hard, especially in that fast-paced world, um, to own your I don't know when you don't have an answer and be able to say, I need to pause and I need to think about why. Let me speak for me personally. If I'm defensive, if someone says something to me and I'm immediately like, no, it's not, right? And I immediately get defensive. There's generally some work there that I need to do. And being able to to know our cues and know the way we act when we are uncomfortable and listen to that internal dialogue that's telling us we don't have enough information. I'm being stubborn, and then take that back and be able to digest it and figure out why, and then make the changes necessary, even when it punches you in the ego. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it will punch you, and it hurts. Um, it will but punch you, you. Yeah, 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 whether you like it or not. Um, but um, it, it does hurt. But then it's about what you do with it, right? And that's that's what you've been talking about. So, and once again, the word curious comes up again. Remain curious, but be open to it as well. Um, I, I love that word. I think it's a, it's a word that I sort of like to keep going back to because I think that's something that we need to be learning and growing all the time. And I think even thinking about your stepdad as well, right? He started to become even more curious around how mm-hmm. the people work and how things and team work. And that's good. Now, you and I have been talking about things from a the lens of a leader. Mm -hmm. If you and I were to change lenses when we start talking about being from an employee's lens, how has employees' expectations of leaders changed? I don't think that people are willing to accept working for an organization that doesn't fit in their values and morals anymore. Right. And I think we're learning a lot from the younger generation that's like, 
if you don't serve me, if the organization organization isn't serving them, they'll leave. And so employee retention is wildly different than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And employees have this new found, I don't know, fire about them of like, you need me. And I think it used to be, we need organizations. And now it's like, no, you need me. Mm-hmm. And so I think that employees are really not putting up with with bullshit anymore and being like, you need to be people focused. You need to understand how you're treating us. You need to have these systems in place. And I think tech has been a big part of that, right? Like watching Facebook and being like, wait, we can expect that our job provides us food. <laughs> we can expect that our jobs provide us health care and mental health services. And we actually get treated like not just an employee, but a human. And once those things become normalized, it's really hard to expect it to, to accept less than that. Mm-hmm. And when you say people, if they don't feel like the 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 purpose is what's what's helping them as individuals. You said they will leave, right? They will get they'll get up and go. What happens if the gre- the grass is not greener on the other side where they go somewhere else? What what do you think they might do then? Well I hope they start their own business. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean I yeah. hope I hope that we, you know, and this is this is one of my biggest missions in life is like if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Mm. And I think we need to stop participating in things that aren't 100% yes for us. And and I realize that that's, I'm going to plug with, I realize that's a very privileged statement and not everyone can just leave a job because it doesn't feel good. And, and I am very much aware of the privilege that I have and the ability to walk away from things that don't feel good. And collectively, if we band together, and stop accepting less than the basic necessities from employees, employers, they're going to have to change. And I want to be a part of forcing that change. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I like it because the thing here is it's almost like we're settling for mediocre and the bar's been raised, but then the mediocre is then. And as you said, there's the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? There's those things whereby we need the food and we need a house and things like that. But if you take that that apart uh, to the side and it's been dealt with, what's left? And then say, so why are you doing this? And then I, th- I look at people, they're doing some stupid hours. They're doing some really, really big hours and they're under massive stress. But then um, but then it depends on who who it is and what they're doing. I mean, if they're doing it and they're under stress and they're, and they're working long hours because there's this big purpose, different to then just being someone who's just trying to please someone else because of a few dollars. And I think our lives and our health are worth a lot more than that. But as you said, it's easy for you and I to say, it's not always easy to do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's why we need communities. Yeah. That's why we need folks that, and I hope I can be a part of that. Like it's my, I see it as my duty to leverage my, my leverage my privilege, right? Like I was born by white. I was born in the West, right? Like those are two of the, 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 I don't know, greatest privileges that someone can just be born with, right? Like I'm not super wealthy, but I can stand up to someone and say, absolutely not. This is not okay because I will eat, right? Like I will be okay in those regards. And so if I can put myself on a limb and or open a door to allow other people in, I see that as my duty. Question I've got for you, and that is, being, being the age group you are, we haven't even talked about the age group, it doesn't matter, but being a, a younger person, talking to now people, and our listeners could be at all different ages as well. If there is young generations coming into an organization, whether it be a small business or a medium or a large business, doesn't matter. Is there one or two things that you would say to that leader, to that owner, what they should be thinking about when they're bringing young people on and the way that they onboard them? Is there anything that in particular you're thinking about, you must do this? I think letting people know how they can give feedback is really important. I think that younger generations are asking for and expecting way more feedback than was ever given before. Employees want to know how they're doing. 
what they're doing well, what they're not doing well, how they can improve. And I think they also want to be able to give that feedback to their organizations and to their managers and feel like they're being heard. And then... Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big one, right? Being heard. Being heard. And I think that goes into my second point. Just asking for feedback is only the first step. You then have to acknowledge that feedback. And mm. you don't have to act on it, right? In, in a sense of um, you don't have to do everything that everyone's telling you to do. But we're going to use our favorite word of the, of the podcast. To be curious enough to understand what the intent was. To see if there's a way that it is possible, either financially or culturally, to implement something that would satisfy that feedback. And I'll give an example. Something like, well, we should have lunch served every day of the week. And a manager might say, that is not possible. We do not have the, the financial means to provide lunch to every employee. But maybe what they were asking for is, hey, I need some unstructured time with my team that we can get to know each other as humans and not be expected to be productive so that we can create bonds that actually enhance efficiency in work. So maybe they don't actually need lunch brought. Maybe it's like, hey, we brought in a catalog of menus or we're going to bring in food trucks and we're going to give an hour to everyone. So the financial responsibility wasn't actually what the person was asking for. It's, hey, we need more human connection. We need space to be able to bond and grow and like each other as humans. And so you might be able to not spend a dollar and could satisfy that same goal. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, cool. So it's so pretty good both sides, actually, whereby... The person actually saying the comment or the statement probably may need to be a little bit clearer. But if they're not, that's what we're saying to the leaders. Be curious and understand more and ask, what do you mean by that? Try and find, try and understand what they're, where they're coming from because they may actually have a great idea. And uh, it could be life-changing. It could be great for the organization. Ashley, um, I'm going to get you to get your crystal ball out now and talk about the future here. And the question I've got for you is, where do you see leadership being in five years? I see it being more collaborative. I see it. And, and maybe I'm speaking from a place of hope. Um, I see leadership being folks coming together and understanding how we can collectively better serve others and how we can continue to make impacts on people and the world and business together. Because what if we could all connect. And I could call up a woman in New Zealand and say, hey, I'm having this cultural thing in my organization. What have you done? Right? Like if we could tap into leaders around the world and be able to share and learn without this concern of, oh, they're my competitor. Oh, I may lose market share. Oh, we may lose profit. Because we understand that being good leaders helps the world. That's just a beautiful way to finish it. Being great leaders is – can you re-say it again? Being great leaders is – being great leaders is the way we can make the world better. Oh, maybe. I don't know. It just flew out of my mouth. Um, I think being great leaders helps the world. Being great leaders helps the world. Mm -hmm. Ashley, it's been awesome talking to you. Thank you. Uh, if, and thanks for joining us on today's show. If our listeners are wanting to get hold of you, where can they go? www.auditmate.com. And also, I am most active on LinkedIn uh, at Ashley Wilson. Excellent. We'll put those in the show notes so the listeners can check that out. But once again, thank you for being with me on the show today. It's been great. Thank you for having me, Dennis. There you go, listeners. Being great leaders helps the world. Hey listeners, what we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Change is incredibly scary, especially with the unknown and unfamiliar territory. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing. Look out for the episodes as they're being released, download them, have a listen, put a review and a rating. Feel free to share them with your friends, your family and your network. Hey, if there's any feedback you'd like to give me about the show or if there's a question you have for the Ask Dennis Freestyle episode, 
then send me an email, dennis at leadingchangepartners.com. Hey, listeners, it's always a pleasure being with you. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world. 